good evening everyone good evening a very warm, very warm welcome to each one of you present here good evening ma'am good evening uh that's one uh, enthusiastic participant we have uh right very warm welcome to each one of you present in this session my name is lata and apart from being the trustee i am also going to be your host for the evening uh today's session is all about how reading can comfort and open up a world of possibilities during a pandemic situation we have our uh, speaker uh, miss kimberly myson joining us from uh, new jersey usa uh, welcome ma'am uh i'll briefly introduce you about uh, td educational and charitable trust TD Educational and Charitable Trust is a group of enthusiasts with a passion towards excellence in education. The objective of this trust is to mentor teachers, parents and students. We aim to share knowledge and guidance in the area of education and remove any hurdles in achieving competencies. Let me now introduce and welcome Dr. G Tangadurai. He is a senior educationist and a national award winner in the field of education. He is currently the director of Presidency Group of Schools. He has been actively helping us and collaborating and bringing in experts for various webinar sessions that we have been hosting. I invite him to reflect upon this topic before we move on to our speaker for the evening. May I invite you, sir? good evening to all uh, good evening uh, mrs kimberly good evening bhagyashali good evening lata lata i could not see you on the picture frame i don't know maybe you have some problem with this uh... yes there's a connectivity issue i'm logged in from two devices i think uh -huh. i got out, so logged out from we could not we, miss... we could not see our host uh, that's the uh, <laughs> so uh good evening to all and then uh, i am very overwhelmed as usual to have about 800 registered but uh, we have about 341 all trickling down slowly and uh, we have a overwhelming um, participant from andhra pradesh uh, 42 karnataka 158 this is what is registered odisha 140 tamil nadu 121 Uh, we have participants from Abu Dhabi, Karnataka, Chandigarh, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Haryana, Gujarat, Goa, Delhi, Muscat, Orissa, Punjab, Kerala, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Telangana, Uttar Pradesh, West Bengal, and others twenty-one. And um, <clears throat> just a word of thanks because these participants make a lot of difference uh, to the success of our webinar. and they have been continuously uh -oh. supporting and being with us and uh, some of the schools which i find very prominently entered this time is hyderabad public school um, which has quite a good number of uh, participants from st joseph college quite a good number of participants i would like to acknowledge with gratitude your um, registration i hope you are also with us um then there is a brinkton international school chatisgarh that's a quite good number of people from chatisgarh and uh, uh, brinkton international school dominates to a great extent and then we have a reliance school from jamnagar then uh, from dubai uh, indian academy uh, we have a couple of dav schools um sacred heart schools uh delhi public school prestige school uh, and uh, uh quite a good number of uh, lord school from uh, lord school from uh, mangalo um <clears throat> jain international schools uh and other schools are there but uh, predominantly what i'm uh, vidya niketan public school uh, landmark school oxford school vidya niketan is there quite a good number and uh, 
Indian schools in Middle East, uh, Vivekananda Academy, uh, SBD International Schools, Indian <laughs> schools. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, I request uh, people, uh, participants to mute your mic, please. That's a basic courtesy that we should have when we are in a, in a big platform like this. Uh, Golden Bells Public School, Punjab, has dominated. I don't know. This is the first entry of this school, and they have made a big uh, number. And um, Lalaji Memorial Omega International School, Tamil Nadu. Um, these are some of the uh, prominent schools which, uh, where the participants are quite a good number. Uh, Jawahar, Vidyalay, and all that. Thank you, all of you, uh, for registering. And I hope uh, you would be joining us soon. And uh, now, coming back to uh, our this evening program, first of all, <clears throat> I should thank... Uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Kimberly uh, Mason, uh, Mason um, and Mr. Bhageshali, uh, who have been kind enough uh, to accept our invitation. Uh, just imagine uh, uh, we have a speaker just across the other part of the world. Uh, it's, a, it's a good morning for them and it's a quite good evening, Sunday evening. And uh, they have started the first thing on a Sunday morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, and it's all because of you that we have the pleasure of gathering today. And uh, <clears throat> before uh, we proceed, uh, we are now at uh, 5.30. Uh, I will just take 10 minutes maximum and uh, then uh, we will uh, go forward with our keynote speaker. Well, uh, today's topic, as uh, you all know, it's all about reading. And uh, our main objective uh, this evening was to see how teachers, uh, how parents, if uh, many of you are also our parents, and if there are parents who have joined us, should be able to influence the children and get them into the habit. Nice to see you, Lata. We are welcome on your facial uh, presentation. Uh, uh, so how we could influence these um, uh, students to read as a habit? Uh, nothing can equal the power of an adult who puts the right book in the child's hands at the right time. That's, the, uh, that's how we elders are very, it could be a great uh, factor to influence the uh, kids. Uh, I think everyone in some way or the other, if one is a voracious reader or reads for pleasure, is always influenced by someone. It may be the grandmother, it can be the father, it can be the teacher, it can be uh, someone who had been influential in helping the child to uh, pick up read, reading. <clears throat> uh, becoming a reader, the process of becoming a reader uh, is nothing short of miraculous. Sometimes uh, all it takes is uh, uh, getting lost in one magical book the way the Harry Potter phenomena has done uh, for the world to open up and uh, life to be transformed. Uh, reading is always something uh, of a mystery uh, that, that unfolds as we explore. Magically holds. And uh, we know that children who, who read frequently and well uh, in school and as well as at home, are very confident learners uh, with a broader understanding uh, of the world. They possess the skills uh, and uh, will enable them to get on well in their college and schools. Well, uh, I have, in my family, I have seen my daughter, 
how she has picked up the reading and of late my grandson both of them and i think though i did not influence my daughter much but uh, uh, but one thing is that she always been being a teacher she has always been in the company of books and there was a lot of books at home uh, probably she picked up a few and that's how she picked up reading i i won't i'm sharing this because uh, i think in every home we as an adult are very much influential uh, in creating this awareness and i still remember you know in those days uh, i used to be in bihar and uh, my native as you all uh, as you can make out from my name is from tamil nadu we used to travel by a steam engine uh, uh, train for nearly 3 days uh, and when we reached there our our uh, our native place that that time known as madras uh, she would not go for toys and garments and you know she would like to go to a place called uh, a bookstall called higan bottoms which is a heritage building in madras and um, and she would like to pick up the books so uh, in other words um, the 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 research shows that uh, choosing books you want to read i mean it has been uh, found out that this choosing the books that you want to read uh, is uh, is the surest way of becoming a very curious and uh, motivated leader uh, sorry me a motivated reader rather than uh, uh, been talking a lot on leadership so motivated reader and uh, giving children the time to read for pleasure both at school and at home uh, is the strategy that will pay off uh, in the greater uh, reading improvement uh, as a school boy myself and uh, as a later on as a teacher of course uh, with a literary inclinations i used to read a quite a good number of books right starting from tolstoy to dickens and uh, george bernard shaw to r k narayan <clears throat> and uh, these books have left a very strong impression in me but late recently though i am a lover of books there is a one little book which i want to show you uh, which made a lot of difference uh, in, in in trying to see how i can read more books this is a, a little book by askin bond is a is a famous writer he has been writing novels and poetry and essays and short stories for half a century now and uh, he is a very popular um, storyteller with children the young ones and uh, this is a little book uh, where there is not much of sub, much of printed matters it's a just uh, certain messages certain passages that he has picked up from various sources and uh, he has also created a space in between so that we can also read and add on to it and uh, one of the beauty of this book is that it not only gives a lot of reflection on life uh, but perhaps uh, it's also great learning matter to the older generations as well and whenever i turn this little book uh, in order to find words that might uh, cheer up uh, when i am in the dumps uh, uh, as we all are at times from time to time this has been a great inspiration now this book has the essence of all the great books and great philosophers and writers and um, here again he has um, written a beautiful thing about how we as an adult have a responsible role in uh, promoting uh, reading habits among the children he writes there are some very often more than often we adults we say we don't have time we are busy with our work uh, so there he reflects here saying there are some who go about proclaiming with the complacent pride that they have no time to read or think what then will 
they be able to give their children apart from a fat checkbook that's a very interesting uh, quote and the other quote uh, which i uh, i felt very interesting to share with you this is something i have been always reflecting success is where preparation and opportunity meet now one thing that this book has enabled me is uh, whenever i read book or i get a beautiful message from any book or a beautiful lines of thoughts uh, i make it a point to write down there is a one thing that i have wrote down here somewhere yeah this is the beautiful lines the quality of mercy is not strained from act 4 scene 1 in merchant of venice it dropped as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath it is twice blessed it blesseth him that gives and him that takes so it's a wonderful little book but lot of reflection and all the reading culminates into this kind of a thought process uh, which is of course uh, very remarkable then i also went through a very beautiful book this is by scholastic i'm just sharing with you because how books matter a lot in our thinking by richard robinson he is the chairman of uh, president and the ceo of scholastic and uh, uh, he has uh, brought out a, a book where uh, a great writers philosophers people in high positions how they have picked up reading and how books have been influential and how adults were influential in inspiring them uh here is um, an inspiration quote where he says nothing equal the power of an adult who puts the right book that's what i shared with you a book in a child's hand at the right time and uh, uh here is someone who uh, she is uh, linda uh, b gambrel phd distinguished professor of education in ugin Uh, T Moore School of Education at uh, uh, Clemson University, if I'm correct in pronunciation, and she writes, "My maternal grandmother was an avid and enthusiastic reader, who read everything from the trash to treasure, from spicy, dicey detective stories to Tolstoy and Dickens, and she often said." there is nothing better than a good read because of my grandmother i grew up loving books that's the influence of an adult uh there's one more i had uh, marked it which i wanted to share yeah she is uh, shirley bryce heath uh, and she writes throughout my early childhood i never knew books i lived with my grandmother until i had to go live with foster parents my grandmother had only a few years of schooling but she learned how to fake reading she would take me on her lap and read books of old testament that what she thought of as the most adventurous stories those of job jonah daniel and the like so you see everywhere a great readers and great book lovers have been always influenced by adults and therefore uh today this evening we have uh, mrs uh, kimberly mayshan uh who is a very experienced uh, teacher as well as a, a long years in 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 library science handling library and she might have interacted with so many children and she might have been an influential person in promoting uh, reading as a habit among the children and it still she is doing it and uh, uh, and she has come forward thanks to her for accepting our invitation to share her thoughts in terms of how to um, engage these students during the pandemic times and this is the golden period of their life because they are at home safe with the parents 
and uh, for homeschooling is uh, uh, at at one point of time is uh, lacks uh, what you call exercise they lack exercise but as uh, uh, ruskin bond has said uh, books are to the mind as uh, exercise is to the body so uh, in that sense uh, i believe uh, that uh, mrs kimberly will share her thoughts this evening and i'm very thankful in the indian namaskar to you and uh, welcome you to uh, to the indian audience there are quite a good number and i'm sure you would have the pleasure of uh, sharing your thoughts and interacting with them as well so i would like uh, uh, the host lata to take it forward and introduce uh, mrs kimberly thank you thank you sir that was uh, in fact a very uh, deep reflection of your uh, idea and uh, probably not not just your idea probably the reality of what reading brings to all of us uh without uh, further ado uh, let me take the pleasure of uh, uh, introducing you to our speaker of the evening miss kimberly myerson she is a licensed uh, elementary school teacher and a certified school librarian with over 15 years of experience she has been named teacher of the year by her colleagues for her dedication and excellence as a teacher and librarian Prior to joining the world of public education, Kimberly worked for several major children trade fair, trade books uh, publishers uh, like Macmillan, Houghton, Mifflin, and Ticknor and Fields. As a part of her duties, she has traveled to book conferences around the U.S. Uh, to promote newly published books. There, she met library librarians and educators who inspired a career change. is kimberly can be found in her library using read aloud storytelling puppets and music to inspire her students to read read and read she firmly believes there is a reader in all of us and her mission is to find the key to set it free over to you ma'am all the participants including me await for your fantastic session that's coming up thank you over hello, to you ma'am Hello, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Namaste. Namaste. Um, I must say I'm a, I'm a little overwhelmed by the um, I, amount of attendees. Um, I'm hoping that I have some good things to share with you this evening. Um, but I guess via my introduction, I just wanted to say that one of the reasons I became a librarian was um, because as I was working in the book publishing industry, I realized that none of the books that I published, that I helped publish, none of these children's books, I, I never saw them in the hands of children. And when I took a job in the book publishing field, that was my, that was my, was my um, dream, was to be able to make books to, to help promote reading with children. But in my job, I never actually saw any children holding my books or holding the books I helped produce or reading them or interacting with them. And I had felt it a little um, unsatisfying. And so, like I said, in that introduction there, I was inspired by all the librarians and teachers that I met in my travels to go back to school and become a librarian. And I must say that I've never looked back. It has been an, such an enjoyable experience yes. being that person who has had the opportunity to influence a future generation of readers. And that is where my, my heart is and where my love is. So I'm happy to, to be here this evening to share that with you all. And I hope that I give you some, some helpful information. Um, so I guess I will just get, get right into it. I'm gonna just share my screen with you so that you can see. Oh, and I actually want, also wanted to say thank you for the invitation because um, You know, a month ago, this never would have been on, on my radar of something to do. And to be able to be speaking to people halfway around the world and sharing my thoughts is, is quite amazing. So thank you all again. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for your time. All right, here we go. Oh. 
All right, can everybody see that? Are we good? Yeah, we can see. Thank you. I can All right, see. You. Beautiful. Beautiful. Because I know sometimes when you share, it doesn't always work the first time. So, all right. So, we're here tonight to just talk about how reading can help us through a pandemic, like how, how, how it's important and what it can do for us, both um, mentally and, and emotionally, to help us cope with a time that is not so good. Let me see here. What am I going to do here? All right. So this is the, the, the things that we're going to be, I'm going to be discussing tonight. So some, first of all, we're going to start with just overview of the effects of the pandemic. Then we'll talk about some how reading can help counterbalance those things. I'm going to offer you some simple solutions for connecting with your students and um, some resources to help them continue to read, 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 because that is the goal, right? To get everybody reading. So this is a quote um, that you may have seen already. It popped up on the internet, oh, maybe back, back in the summer sometime. And when I first saw it, I thought, oh my goodness, who wrote this? This must be a quote from so long, long ago. And actually it's not. It was written by a woman, Kitty O'Meara. And she is a Wisconsin um, native here in the United States. And she is a an ex-educator and uh, also a, um, um, a reverend. And she spoke to what we're talking about this evening. So I, I added it in. Ma'am, your voice is breaking. Um, if everyone could please go on mute, uh, that will help. I don't think I have anything else running either. I just want to double check, but I don't think I, now I turned everything off, so okay. All right, so first of all, uh, I think you're is it all better right. now? Can you hear me better yeah, now? it's fine, it's fine. Okay, so first of all, how has living through a pandemic affected students' lives? That's, that's the question, right? So first of all, it affects everyday life. We're, students are more isolated. Every day looks pretty much like the day before. There, you kind of lose that sense of time passing. And there's oftentimes there's a lack of schedule. So oftentimes students and maybe adults too, we feel kind of adrift in this time. It affects our learning, students learning as well. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I'm sure, you know, everybody was in a remote learning situation. We were scrambling to put things together. Learning became very disjointed, if at all, at the beginning, back in March, in April and May. Um, now, in the fall, I'm not sure what it, what it looks like exactly in India, but here in the United States, it is, it's different in different areas. Some students are back in school, but they're back in school part-time. Some of them are back in school full-time. Some of them are completely remote. Some of them are doing a combination of partially remote, partially in-person. So it's still disjointed. Um, and for the most part, I would say that it is, it is producing a lack of connection for students, a lack of connection with their peers, um, a lack of physical connection with their with their teachers that has resulted in a slowing of the learning process. Students are still learning, but they're learning at a much slower pace. And I was just reading a study the other day that said they were actually surprised that the that the that students coming back to school this fall were not actually that far behind where they should have been, but they're expecting that to to kind of, kind of multiply the longer this, um, this pandemic stays in effect because uh, we are learning, learning remotely is more difficult for students. And as an educator, I find that it's more difficult to, te to teach this way as well. 
I like being hands-on with my students and I, so I cannot be that way right now. Um, so also students are more dependent on their parents, their grandparents, their older siblings and themselves for their own learning because that teacher isn't in a room with them as much anymore. So these are, these are all things that are going to affect their ability to learn and to learn quickly. Um, lastly, the pandemic has affected social emotional health. Students, do, like I said before, don't have that connection with their peers. They don't have that, this connection with the, that many adults in their life. There's a lot of anger, there's a lot of fear, worry. Many of them have lost their sense of purpose. They wonder, you know, what, why am I here? What is, what's going on? Some of them have sunk into depression. Um, they've also lost that opportunity to build social skills. For the younger students, this is very important. Um, and even if they're in school, like my students are actually in school with me part of the time, they um, do not have the opportunity to interact in the same way because they're required to stay at their desk. They are behind a shield. They are wearing a mask so they cannot see expressions. They cannot be next to another student. They cannot have those same interactions that we would expect students to be having. So that is very difficult for all of them. But how can reading counterbalance these effects? Well, first of all, there are lots of benefits to reading. Now these benefits, as I'm going through them, you're gonna notice that they're kind of there all the time. These benefits would be there whether or not we were in a pandemic. I just feel that during a pandemic, if you were reading, these benefits actually are uh, accentuated. So first of all, reading definitely improves literacy. We know that the more you read, the better reader you become. Um, it helps you improve your language skills. So not only your, your reading skills, but your, your verbal language skills. You learn more vocabulary. When you read dialogue, you understand how people speak. If people read to you, you hear how people would interact with one another. And all of these things help our students. Of course, reading is the foundation for everything else. I once had a principal who told me that math was the most important subject that was ever taught in school. And I had to argue with him because I said, without reading, you can't even do math. So much of the math world is based in, in reading. So you need to be able to read first. You need to be able to read to, to learn science. Everything comes from reading. So we need to have that foundation. Of course, reading now can provide quality family time. Um, we are with our families more than ever. And this is a, a great opportunity to invest in our families and in our, in, our, in our reading by spending time together reading books. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Books also provide an escape for students. So all those socio-emotional um, issues that I, was dis that I mentioned before, some of them can be counterbalanced because books allow kids to escape. They allow them to go places um, that are away from this world, this, this world that does not look very pleasant right now. Um, and for all of us, I mean, it's, it's a place for us to go. I mean, you can go anywhere in a book. I tell this to my students all the time. You're not happy with sitting here in New Jersey in your, in your, in your room, get a book. Go, go, go have an adventure in Lilliput with, the, with Gulliver. You know, go someplace in a book. And it also provides a safety net. And by that, I mean, when kids read books or even when adults read books, if we see a hero or a heroine who is surmounting all odds to be successful, we believe that we too can do those things and that we can be successful. We live through the adventures of, of these characters. And that for kids is, is huge. So, how do we as parents, librarians, educators, encourage our students to read? What do we do? So when I was putting this presentation together, I, um, I was told that there would be 
all of these groups of people here. And I said, wow, that's a diverse group of people. And I don't, I want everybody to, to be able to take something away. So I'm hoping in this next part that everybody finds something that is, that is a good takeaway for them. And I'm gonna to try to address all three groups simultaneously. So my belief is that you should start with what you know. So this is what a library looked like not too many months ago. Students browsing, working together. We don't see that now. So then that means that we have to reimagine it. What does it look like now? So for me, this is what it has become to look like. Um, this is a Bitmoji library. And some of you may have heard of Bitmoji or maybe even use this yourself, um, but it's just a fun way to present information to kids. And since I can't have my students in my library, and since I can't be with them all the time, I brought the library to them. So this is a just simply a Google slide that I have um, decorated and put myself in there, my, my, my own Bitmoji image. And um, each of the things that are in this library are links. So when I go and read to a classroom, um, I might read, for example, at this when I use this particular one, I read this story, Finding Winnie, which is the story of how the character of Winnie the Pooh was inspired. And I read the book to the students. And then what I did is I, in this library, I put a link. And if you click on it, it takes you to Hello, somebody else My reading the story. Poppin, and I will be so, um, now these students, when they're not with me, can go ahead and um, and listen to that story again. Oops, I'm gonna go back. There we go. Um, they can listen to it on their own. I also added other stories that I read during the course of, of the weeks. I read this Goldie Sox books. I read this a book, a library book for Bear. Each of them has a link. In addition, since we were on a bear theme, I put a link here to the London Zoo that takes them to the bear exhibit so they can go and learn about bears. I put a video here in the, on my smart board that shows, I'm gonna just show you this real quickly. It shows you the actual person that was in that story about, this is actually about the real bear that was at the London Zoo um, that inspired Winnie the Pooh because it was an actual real story, oops, keep going to that one. And each of these links, I said, like I said, is something that students can do. So not only is it a resource for me, a way for me to present my information in class, but it is a way for students when they are home to be able to revisit that, that material. It's a way for parents to interact with their students about with the material that I've presented in school. And it gives them additional things that, that they can look at and learn about when I'm not there to teach them. Because my, my teaching time has here has been limited from my normal 55 minutes with the students each week, I only get about 30. So I have to condense everything that I want to do. And I also wanna give them something to do at home because I think some of the difficulty that parents have been having is that they don't have access to a lot of resources. All right, so that's the idea behind my Bitmoji libraries. And I did them, I made them for all my grades. So this was my kindergarten one. And I updated each week with whatever topic that I'm that I'm exposing the children to. So this one, which you've, whoops. Hello, everybody. Sorry about that. I did not mean to do that. And oops. I will be reading oops, oops, one of my oops, oops. new favorite books. I love this book because it tells I didn't mean to do that. This is one I made for the second grade students when we were, um, we were studying Diwali. Um, I celebrate Diwali and I want to share that with them because it's not something that a lot of students here in the United States know about. So I made a library that contained lots of information about that, videos, how to's, things that they, this, this one teaches them how to actually make a rangoli so they can do it, they can try it on their own if they'd like. Lots of different things for them to do. 
and I brought my own personal. Shared. My screen is not shared right now. Yes, I am not. sorry about that. Did we get out of the screen share? I must have clicked on the wrong button. Let's try that again. Here we go. Are we back? Yes, ma'am, we can see. Okay, there you go. Sorry about that. I'm telling you, click one wrong button and you end up <laughs> in a very wrong place. All right. So here, like I said, this is what I shared with my second grade students. And um, we read some stories in class, but it gave them, and it got them excited because this was me sharing a part of me with them. Like I said, this is not something they're generally familiar with, but they were so excited that I was excited. Ms. Myerson, you celebrate, what do you do? So here, here was a way to share with them. And I will tell you that the, that week, all my books about Diwali or uh, that had that were Indian folk tales or fairy tales left my library because I was excited about reading those things and sharing with them. And that I think is a major component for um, getting our students to read is your own enthusiasm. The more excited that you are, the more excited they will be. This is what keeps happening. I keep clicking on that. I don't want to click on that. And now I stop sharing again, right? No, I'm still sharing. This is the one I made for a third grade library. And I wanted to show you this simply because here in the United States, one of the things that I do in my school every year is I have a book fair. Actually, I have three of them. And a book fair is when a company comes in and basically sets up a small bookstore in the school and then the students can come and with their parents and they can browse through the books and they can purchase the books it is a way to make books that they can keep forever and ever accessible to them some students parents don't want to go to bookstores or don't go to bookstores regularly they um they don't shop on amazon and get their students books so here I bring the bookstore to them. Now this year we couldn't do that because of the pandemic. We can't have people gathering in large groups. So what we did is we made a virtual book fair. Uh, we worked with the company and we had we ran the, the, the fair for two weeks and students were able to shop online. Now it wasn't quite the same, but it was a way for them to have access that they normally, and they actually were looking forward to it when they saw this, this, when this screen popped up in our, on our library week and they saw the book fair was there, the kids got so excited because this is something that every year they look forward to. They love browsing through those books. They love purchasing them and creating their own home libraries. So I don't know if that is something that um, is done in your schools, but if you have that ability, you could even do an online one at this time. But that's what I want to show with this screen now. Let's see, okay, here we go. So again, we're not able to check books out. Some schools are not. I actually am able to because I am in, in person right now, um, but, and how do we, and we, but the kids can't come to the library like they used to. I can't hand them a book in the, they can't come to the circulation desk, they can't do any of that stuff. So that's what we knew. What do we do when you don't, when you can't do that anymore? Well. I created mobile libraries in my school. So all of my colleagues and I, we took our book carts and we loaded them up with books. We decorated them in the theme. Our school theme this year is um, anchored in strength. So we created our um, book carts. We decorated them to reflect our theme. We loaded them up with books and we are now mobile librarians. And this was a great opportunity to talk to students about in the old days here, um, how there were bookmobiles. And actually I, as a student, used to go to a bookmobile when I was growing up and we talked about that. I read them books about bookmobiles. We talked about in other countries, how not every student has, may have access to a library and how the libraries go to them. I have several books about mobile libraries in other parts of the world. The kids were so excited to see that in some places, your books may come to you on a donkey or a camel or a burrow. 
and um, and there are there are libraries that are boats that float on the rivers, and it's such a, it was such a so different from their experience, but it was a great opportunity. So I took a moment, took, took something that wasn't all that ex, all that great for us, you know, having not being able to come to the library was a disappointment for the children, but I made it into something exciting and it got them inspired. These books were all taken off the shelf so quickly. The kids look forward every week to that that mobile library coming to their to their um, classroom. Now, of course, for some schools, you can't even they can't aren't even allowed to do that. They can't even take that mobile library around. So what do you do? Well, on the other side of the screen, um, I saw this and I actually was at a presentation where a library, they did this, they created a way for students to reserve their books. And um, in the United States, we have a, a service called Grubhub where food can be delivered to your house. Um, you order it online and then somebody goes and picks it up for you and delivers it to your house. Well, they did a, a, a little spoof on that and they called it Book Hub and the students make their reservations for their books and then the books are delivered to their classroom for them. And um, that is a big hit for a lot of kids. They're so excited to get those books. Now, in my school, because I can go around with my, with my mobile library, I, don't, I didn't really need to do that. But then I realized that some of my students weren't getting the books that they wanted because yes, I was filling up my cart, but I can't bring my whole library. I can only bring part of it. So my problem was, well, how do I get the books that the students actually want if they're not on the cart to them? So rather than going the whole nine yards and making the, the, the book hub kind of thing, And everything so I could deliver it to them. And then I gave them some choices. They could either tell me a specific title or author, a book they a book from a series they want to read, or I gave them, they could just pick a genre. And I would match up a book. I pick, I would pick the book for them and bring it to their to their classroom. And they would they submit these and um, I collect the books and I drop them off in their into their classrooms. Now this is great also for the students who are fully remote because what I do for them if they click that all remote button and I know they're not going to be in school, I still gather the books and then I leave them in the, the vestibule of our school with their name on it and their parents swing by and come and collect the books. And so they have books at home. Now, again, this is something that I'm able to do here because we still have access to our library. I know that may not be possible for some people because you may be so completely remote that your school may be closed completely Completely. And if that's the case, then you need, oops, then you need some full free ebook resources. And these are just a few of the many that are out there. All of these um, vendors offer free books for kids. Um, most of them don't even need a subscription. Some of them you do have to sign up for a free subscription in order to use them for a free account but most of them you can just go in and click on the book and read it. Epic, which is one that my school uses a lot. Epic is um, nice because if you are an educator, you can um, create a free account for your class. And then you can actually assign books for your students to read so that you can keep them on level. And, or if you know that a particular student likes a particular topic, you can assign a, a book about that topic and keep them interested in reading. So this is all about getting the resources to those kids. All right, and um, these all have, when I share this presentation with you, you will, you will know that all of these have links to the actual site so that you can just go there. You don't have to look them up yourself. And I'm not sure again, how many of these will be available in India, I think, most of them would be, they might be like Amazon, you might have your Amazon India, but I'm pretty sure Oxford Owl will be there. That's a, that's a British. That's a British, um, uh, British made site. This is the, um, this is called the 
um, International Children's Library. I think that's what that one is called. I can never remember, it's a long title, so I can never remember it exactly, but that has a lot of classics. So if you want to get your students reading classic books, that you can find them there. Same with Project Gutenberg. A lot of the old time classics are there and not just Western classics either. There are other, there are classics from around the world, which I actually find very nice. It gives students an opportunity to, to explore literature from other places than their own home country. All right, so again, getting students to, excited about reading was easy pr prior to the pandemic. I would invite in guest readers. I've had people from our Board of Education come in. I've had other librarians in my district come in. I've had friends, other authors come in. Um, I've had, I've invited, um, I've had author visits every year. My school sponsors one author to come to our school and they spend the entire day in our school reading with the kids, showing them how they, how they do their craft. Um, this picture here in the center with the man drawing at an easel. He is, he is an author. He's author Timothy Young, picture book author. He came last year. Actually, he was here right before the pandemic, <laughs> right before we closed down. And the students were so engaged in his stories and so enthusiastic. And you can see in the picture below, um, most, many of them are checking out his books. So every book I had that was written by Timothy Young left my library immediately with his visit because they were so excited. So a great way to get kids to read is to have guest readers come in, to have, to have them, give them an opportunity to meet the authors and illustrators who create those books. Even the non-readers get excited. Um, it's just like having, having an author in person is, is amazing, an amazing inspiration for them. However, we can't do that right now. So what can we do differently? Well, one teacher reimagined it this way. I got this as an email just the other day. She sent this out to our staff. She's looking for her for readers to come and read to her, her class during their lunchtime. So she wants to, while they're sitting in their classroom eating their lunch, because that's where they have to be these days, she wants somebody to come in and read to them. So our staff members and um, have signed up to go and they are, will be just doing a Zoom read aloud. And I thought this was brilliant. And I will probably be borrowing this idea or harvesting it as our, we librarians call it in, um, in March when we have Read Across America Week because that's when I usually invite all those guest readers is during that very special week here in America where we, where we um, celebrate reading for an entire week. Um, and this year, I don't think I will be able to have my guest readers come in. So this will probably be an option for me, but anybody can do this. You can just invite somebody to come and read to your class. And um, I generally invite people from the community who are, and then I have them read books that relate to um, what they do, or to some sort of character development um, topic so that students can discuss it with them. So like when the mayor comes, we talk, I usually have him read a book about government or about, about advocacy or something so that they can then talk about how his job relates to that. And it's a good way to expose children to careers as well. And um, and of course, I can't have that author come visit physically this year. So we are, cons we are planning to have a virtual author visit. And in fact, the author that I'm inviting this year is this one here in the um, upper left-hand corner, Roxy Monroe. She has written, oh, I don't know, maybe 25 amazing children's books about all different topics, a lot of them nonfiction. And she has a very lovely, um, virtual visit that she does with students. So we were planning for that. But all of these authors, and these are just a few of the many who will do a virtual visit to your school. Some of them will do them for low or no cost. 
I think in this day, most of them are starting to charge now because they haven't been able to go into schools, which is where they usually, how they, they supplement their incomes. But this little man flying with the book down here where it says virtual, that is, will take, is a link to take you to a list of authors that do virtual visits um, here in, from, um, from the United States. I'm sure there must be similar things in India that you could that you could um, take advantage of. But having a virtual author visit will definitely get your kids excited about reading. Um, just make sure that they have access to the books. Now, and of course, alternatives to a virtual author visit, maybe you can't even do that. Maybe that's too much. Maybe you don't have the bandwidth. Maybe you don't have the connection. Maybe you can't even get all your kids gathered in, at one time. Well, you can provide your students with websites that are author created websites. So there are a couple, oops, a couple different kinds. Um, here on the, the left-hand side of the screen, this is the website for author Mo Willems. And um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he is the author of the Nuffle Bunny series. He's also author of the Elephant and Piggy series. He has an entire website that students can go and they can explore his books. They can play games related to his books. They can do drawing projects related to his books. It's just a fun place for kids to go. And when I, when I do, a unit with my students about Mo Willems. We do an author study. This is one of the resources that I give them because it's something they can do on their own to continue, continue exploring that author's body of work without me being there. And it keeps them excited and want, makes them want to read. A lot of authors in this pandemic have done an amazing thing that they have actually gone on recorded themselves reading their books. So these are just three that I pulled that I know of and have used um, because um, they're just people I'm familiar with. So Brad, Mel Brad Mel Mel Meltzer, he has written a bunch of short biographies. And so some, for students who enjoy the biography or enjoy learning about people, he has recorded many, many of his books. And all you do is you go to their site and you can and you can look at the whole series. Let me let me take a look at this one with you. This is Lauren Tarshis. She has oh wait now it's not finding it. Oh I'm sorry. That did work last night. I'm not sure why it's not working. Huh. Um let me try this one. If hers work. Oh, none of them are working right now. Great. Sorry, my apologies. But trust me, they're there. <laughs> and and uh, my, my links must just have an, an error in them. Um, but they are. Sometimes, Kimberly, those uh, links, uh, they change. Uh, it could be. It could be dynamic. So um, it, as long as the text is there, Folks can search and find them later. Yes, they can search and find them. But when you go to their site, you'll see that they have recorded them episodically. So they they record each chapter or several chapters. The trick with them, and I wanted to show you, is that you have to start at the end, at the bottom of the screen, and work your way up because the way YouTube records, you know, um, places them, the most recent is at the top. So that's usually the end of the book. So just when you're when you're directing students, you have to make sure that they understand that they have to find the first chapter of the book that they want to listen to. Um, but I wanted to show you the Lauren Tarshis, this first one here, because we talked, I talked earlier about how reading books can help kids because they can feel um, that they've, they can read about other kids who have survived, not necessarily similar situations, but, but difficult situations. And her books, I Sur the I Survive series are about kids who have survived um, major problems in the world. So most of them, they're not even all about things that happened in the United States, although many of them are. Uh, the one that's advertised here at the top is I Survived the California Wildfires, which is a more recent one because those just took place a couple of years ago. But she has I Survived um, 
the sinking of the Titanic. I survived um, the eruption of, of Pompeii. Um, I survived the, the tsunami uh, that was, so she has all of them. So it's great for kids who like adventure stories and it's great for those kids who really want to, to be able to, to live through a terrible, a, a terrible time and, and, and feel that there's light at the end of the tunnel. And of course, a lot of authors have, um, they have done Facebook live recordings. And this author here that I have, this is Dan Gutman. He's a New Jersey native, although he now, he defected, he lives in New York City now. <laughs> but he, uh, he has spent, he spent the entire summer reading every single day. He had a two o'clock time slot every day and he would read chapters from his books right from the comfort of his living room. And um, they're all there, they're all recorded so kids can go back and listen to them now. A lot of authors are still doing this. And I know that um, Mo Willems, he did a draw with Mo every day. Um, so kids could go and see how he could do a drawing project with him. So it wasn't just reading, he was, he was exploring his artistic side as well and giving and kids an opportunity to express themselves through drawing. All right, let's see. Um, another great way that I try to inspire my students to read pre-pandemic was to host family literacy nights. And what you're seeing in these images are some of my literacy nights. Um, what I do during these evening events is I pick a theme and then I invite all my students to join me that evening with their parents. They have to come with a parent because the whole point is you spend time with your child exploring books. I read for about 15 minutes and I do this A, to model reading to the parents so that they can see what a read aloud should look like or sound like. I do that so they can hear the stories that are interesting to their student, to their children. And then after I've read the story and we've talked about it a little bit, I have stations set up that students can explore the theme that we were, that the night is, is based around um, through art, through writing and through food. Generally we have a snack and through some sort of kinesthetic activity. So you can see here, this, um, some of these pictures were our Elephant and Pity Night. Again, I love Mo Willems, so, and the students love his books. So I dressed up as Piggy, because of course that gets the kids excited as well. And we made Elephant and Piggy puppets. They had to have up the this, this student at the top of the screen. If you can't tell what he's doing, he has, we made a nest out of pipe cleaners and we put plastic eggs in it and they had a relay race. They had to put the nest on their head and walk between cones as a relay because that was one of, in one of the books there is a elephant or Gerald character has, he ends up with a bird's nest on his head and the birds all, they all hatch. And it's a, it's a whole, um, it upsets Gerald very much that he has a bird nest on his head. So I took that piece of the book and I made it into an activity that the, so the kids could get a little, little like exercise, practice their coordination and have a little fun. Um, some of the other things that we did, the students were uh, creating their own dialogue for Elephant and Piggy. That's what this dad is doing with his son here. And that's also this mom with her son. Um, when I, with my first graders each year I do we have an Italian night and we study the, um, the author Tame De Paolo in his Strega Nona series. And my whole night is themed around Italy. So the students, after we read a Strega Nona story, they get to, they have a pasta snack and they get to learn Italian um, using the iPads and, a, and an app on there to help them um, learn Italian words. They get to look them up and practice saying them and their parents are there to help them along and it's kind of nice because we do have a lot of students in um, my town that are of Italian descent but none of them speak Italian so 
It's kind of a way for them to connect that way. They made chef hats because of course, if you're, you know, you, if you're the, the, the image of the Italian American is the pizzeria owner in many ways. So they, they make chef hats. They made placemats with a map of Italy on them. And um, it was just a fun, it's a fun night. It's a way to connect through literature and it shows parents the importance of reading. But now, can I do that now? Absolutely not. So what I have done, again, going back to my Bitmoji library, I have created the, a theme months in some cases. So this was my first graders. We celebrated not just November, it was Die November. And um, we read stories about dinosaurs. I had activities about dinosaurs, dressed up as a dinosaur and went to this classrooms so they could see, see me having fun. Um, and all these activities, again, because they're in my Bitmoji library, are accessible to the parents to do at home. <laughs> and to the students who um, want to continue uh, having some fun at home and still learning. And how am I doing on time here? Doing okay? Yes, okay. All right, so the last part, when all else fails, when you, and a lot of that part was for teachers, but there's some things for parents there too. But when all else fails, really you're there to share your love of reading. That's, that's, that to me is, is, it, is it in a nutshell. And I think um, Sir re re referred to that in his opening remarks that we are inspired by the readers we see around us, by the reading being modeled for us. So if you don't have anything else, just share your love of reading with your students. So put a spotlight on that reading. So number one, model reading, okay? And that, that could be as simple as just you know, sitting in your chair and reading a manual that you need for work, whatever it is that you need to read or love to read, just do it in sight of your, of your children. They need to see that you're a reader and it doesn't have to be a novel. I think a lot of people feel that, that, they're not really reading if they're not reading a fiction book and they don't enjoy fiction. That's not true. I once did a project with my teachers. Um, I did a display case, a back to school display case. And it was um, what our teachers read over the summer. And I asked teachers to, to tell me something that they read. And I, I made little models of them holding um, the cover of the books that they read. My gym teacher said to me, I don't read. I said, what do you mean you don't read? Of course you read. He said, no, I don't read. I said, well, I said, do you read Sports Illustrated? He's like, well, yeah, I read that. I said, well, that's, that's reading. He said, yeah, but that's just a magazine. I said, no, 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 that, that's reading. So his, his little model had a, had a copy of Sports Illustrated in his hands because that is reading. It does not have to be a book or a fiction book, but whatever it is, just model it for your kids. Read to your students, to your children, or and with them. And those are two different things. When you read to them, you are modeling what a reader sounds like. You are, they're hearing your inflection, your pauses. They're hearing what, a, what good reading should sound like. Reading with your students gives your students an opportunity to show you how they read. Now, you might have them just read to you, just them, or you might choose to read with them where you read a paragraph, they read a paragraph. Or there are actually books out there in two voices where part of the writing is, in, is marked in one color and the other part is marked in another color and you each take one color and you, and you read it together. Um, and those are awesome ways to, to engage with your students. I know that my students in school, we do that. I actually put them out and I have them read at Buddy Read with them, uh, with those kinds of books. And they love it because it's very clear who gets to, to read which part and they get to help each other. 
but you can do it with, you know, it doesn't have to be two students reading together. You as a parent can read with your kids this way. And you don't have to have a special book. You can just choose any book, just taking turns reading. Okay. Listen to an audiobook together. A lot of people discount audiobooks and they say, oh, that's not real reading. And, you know, and no, it's not physically reading words, but again, it's, it's listening to stories. It's listening to how language sounds. And just because you're listening doesn't mean you can't discuss. You know, if something comes up in that audiobook that, you know, you see your child has a puzzled look, well, pause the audiobook, talk about it. You know, or if there's a, a difficult part in the story, something that, you know, maybe a something happens to a character that is uncomfortable, stop, talk about it. That's what readers do. They, they, when they, when they read a story, they're making connections. Well, you can do the same thing when you are listening to a book and you can do that together very easily. To make reading special and exciting, create a reading nook. You can do this in a classroom. I have a special spot in my library that is filled with bean bags and, and cushions so the kids can go and hang out there. Um, you can do that in your home too. And it doesn't have to be something that's grandiose. It can be simply, you know, um, a special cushion in, in a window or in the corner of, of a room. It could be in their bedroom, it could be in the living room. Or for those of you who work at home and you, you have your kids with you, you know what? Create a reading nook in your workspace. And you might be thinking, are you crazy? No, absolutely not. Make that a little, that little space, that's their quiet space, that's their reading space. So when they're in that space, they can't talk to you, they must be reading. So they can be, but they can still be near you because a lot of times all kids crave is that they want to be near you. And so they come in and disrupt your work and, and you're pulling your hair out, you're saying, oh my goodness. No, make a special spot. And that comes from my own experience as a child. My mother um, had that. She had a sewing room and she didn't want to be bothered when she was sewing, but she made a little shelf, a little library for me in there with my few books that I owned. I only owned a few. We, we got most of our books from the public library. And when she was in there sewing, I wasn't allowed to bother her, but I could sit all, all I wanted and read my books. And so that's what I would do. I was just in the space with her reading. Establish dear time every day. Now, dear is an acronym that stands for drop everything and read. And we do this in school a lot. Um, sometimes it's for special occasions, sometimes it's just random, but it means exactly what it says. When it's dear time, you just stop whatever it is you're doing and you read for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you decide the time. In school, we usually, we usually read for about 10 or 15 minutes because for the younger kids, I, I work with primarily primary grades, Read, sitting and reading from sustaining for more than 10 minutes is very hard for them. So we might start at the beginning of the year with five minutes, but we work our way up. And usually by the end of the year, we're at 15 to 20 minutes. But it can be kind of fun for your kids if you're in the middle of doing something, you know, some, some task, and you say, oh, it's deer time, and they have to stop that task and go and read. That establishes, that does two things for you. It might break up an onerous task, or it might show them that reading is so important that we're just going to stop whatever it is we're doing, and we're going to go do it right now. Another way to get kids to, to be excited about reading is to record your student reading. It could be a favorite poem, it could be a part of a story. Maybe they really, really liked a section of a book, record them reading it and then let them listen to themselves or record them reading it and then send that to a relative who's far away. Um, you can even record yourself reading if you would like and have your, let, let your child listen to you. And um, we do this, I do this in school a lot because again, I have my students are not always with me. So I might read something and then let them listen to it later on. I'm going to be doing this with my students um, coming up. I had, I had about 25 students who, 
whose poetry was chosen to be published in a, in a national publication. And I want them to record themselves reading those published poems that we're going to then share with the rest of the school. So I think that will inspire maybe some of the other students to read, to not only read poetry, but to write their own poetry as well. So you can use any, any resource you want to record. I just gave a few here. And then of course you can always read the book and then watch the movie and discuss. And I think that's the important part of that. And I always tell kids, read the book first, then watch the movie. Because you read a book, although the author is describing things to you, you're creating that world in your head. But when you watch a movie, you are watching somebody else's vision. Um, so, but then at the end of it, Discuss, discuss what's, what was the same, what was different, what part, what did you like best about the book compared to the movie? What did you like best about the movie? There's a, a whole world of discussion that you can have there. And then of course, use book talks to hook your students on reading. This is more for the librarians and, and the, the teachers, but you don't have to read a whole book. You can just talk you know, for three minutes about a book and get your students excited. I, um, I did that with a book that I had, one book that I then had students who were reserving that for the next four months because they were so excited about the book. I must have done a good job. You can actually have students create their own book talks. If they had a book that they loved, have them, have them give a book talk to the rest of the kids. And you can do that easily remotely because they can be reading, they could have read a book at home and then do that book talk online, All right? And I think, that is, we've come to the end. So this is a good quote. Um, and I think it was, it kind of encompasses the theme of today with, if you can't do it one way, you got to find another way with the goal to, to have kids reading. And there are so many ways to go about doing that and they don't have to be the way had before, but you can, you can find a way. And then lastly, if anybody has anything they want to ask, I guess we can, we have a little time for questions. I know, I think we were supposed to be done around nine o'clock. So, but. And I'm going to, um, and then of course, if you need, if you want to reach out to me, this is my email address. You can reach out there. Oh. I'm going to. All right. I'm hoping that everybody found something in this presentation that they can take away and use to help their students, whether it be their classroom students or whether it be their children. Uh, the, the, uh, there was a wonderful uh, comments coming from the participants. And uh, they all say that there's a lot to take home. And uh, they liked uh, some of your ideas which they would like to implement in their schools in the library. Uh, one thing was appreciated very much, reading uh, Nook, uh, which, uh, somebody has written about it. Uh, definitely we'll capture some of these comments. Excuse and me, Matt, you. can I ask? Yeah, yeah, sure. Hello? Yeah, somebody was saying, yeah. Yeah. Ma'am, can I ask some questions? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Ma'am, actually, I'm a librarian. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you know uh, now? From, I mean, from primary to high school, the children who are coming, they like to read more uh, comical books, yeah, picture books only. For example, my son, he also like to read only if the, if the storybook won't contain the picture, he don't like to read. How can we motivate those children to read? Well, I would argue that they are reading. Just because they're reading a book with pictures doesn't mean that they're not reading. And remember, remember, 
going back to the beginning, remember I said that reading can be, it's, it can be a comfort for kids. And I think those kids that reread the same book, the same picture book over and over and over again, they're doing it because they're getting comfort from it. Um, it might be, it might be just that it's the, the story that they know. So, and maybe, maybe right now the world is not a place they, that's very comfortable for them. So they want something that they know the ending. This is how this book ends. I'm, I'm going to read it again because this, this is, I, there's no worry here. Um, and I think that reading the same thing over and over still builds fluency. It's still, every time you read something, you take something new away from it. So I wouldn't discourage them from doing, rereading the same things. And I definitely don't discourage my students from reading graphic novels. I, my brother was somebody who was a non-reader. Like he didn't like to read at all. When he was in high school, he discovered in the library, a book of uh, Marvel comics, Iron Man, all of those guys. He, it changed him completely. He checked that book out for an entire year. The librarian had to chase him down. But you know what? He went on to go to college. He double majored in bio, biology and chemistry. He be became a food chemist. He has done, has had so many jobs. He had a job where he ran a million, $30 million food laboratory. And to this day, you know what he reads? Comic books. That is what his choice of reading is. He is a middle-aged man <laughs> with children uh, who are grown children of his own. And every Wednesday you will find him at the comic book store getting the newest collection of comic books. And I would argue that he's still a reader. And these days comic books aren't what they were either. They're, some of those graphic novels are incredibly challenging. Um, it's not only in content, but you know, the, the, to the topics that they address, but the illustrations are, are amazingly complex. And if you cannot read that, the, the text with the picture, you will miss out so much. And I actually tell my students, I am a terrible, terrible graphic novel reader because I grew up reading only um, prose and, and to read, have to read the pictures all the time is really hard for me. And um, I think that these days students, there's a lot more graphic novels out there than there used to be. And I don't, I don't really see a problem with it. I think eventually your child will find other things to read. Now, as a parent, you may feel that, yeah. oh, he's got to read. You can keep presenting things to them. I, and that's what I, I, I do. I always give them different options. I say, you know, I'm glad that you're reading that, but you want to, how about try this instead? Or try this in addition to. And I try to find something that is of the same topic as that book that they like. And I also tell you that I have a fifth grader that when Halloween rolled around this year, he asked me for the same picture book that he has checked out for the last five years. So I went and found, and I knew exactly what it was because he's checked it out every year for Halloween and he keeps it for like two months. Nobody else can read it. <laughs> and I went and got it for him and he still has it. It is now December and he's, he's continuing to read it. And the other day he said, Miss Meyerson, he's like, you know, I still have that book. I said, I know. He's like, but, but I really like it. I said, I know. I said, are you reading it? He's like, every day. And I said, like, keep it, keep reading. But you know, he also is now checking other books too. It just took him a while. Okay. So that was a very Thank long you. answer to your question. <laughs> Thank um, you very much. Ms. Kimberly, I have a question. May I go ahead, please? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you for the informative session. And I'd like to thank Mr. Tangadurai and his team for taking up this uh, opportunity to make us all be present on this platform. And Ms. Kimberly, a special thanks to you because I'm taking up loads of ideas and going. But oh, before so I leave, sorry? I said, good, I'm glad. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Um, but before I leave, I'd like to know, I have this kid in grade three and I am trying to push her out of uh, picture books. 
like um i won't say push but i'm just trying to weed her out of it but she's really not into um books that don't have colorful pictures so what do i do how do i help her well you know what's nice is that there are books these days for that transitioning reader going from those picture books into more of the chapter book that actually still do have pictures yeah. um I found I use uh, a lot of the Jennifer Holm books, um, Baby Mouse series, the Squish series. Um, also, there's a new series. Um, what's it called? Um, Owl Diaries. Yes, she Those, loves Owl Diaries. I'm sorry, okay, but so, she loves Owl Diaries. Okay, so she's so she's already moving past that picture book. That those are yes. chapter books. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Maybe you go from there, you could try something. Oh, I'm thinking like maybe the, the simple Judy Bloom books, like, um, like Pickle Juice or the one in the middle is the Green Kangaroo, something like that, that mm-hmm. they have a few less pictures and a little bit more text. And just kind of keep going that way slowly. But like I said before, as long as they're reading, to me, it doesn't matter how many pictures are there, as long as they're reading something. I, I even tell kids, you know, check out a cookbook. You are reading. But the, the caveat with that is always to tell them if they check out a cookbook, they have to bring me a sample of whatever they make. That's, that's the <laughs> So I get okay. cookies and things. I like I get snacks. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Thank you so much. That was really informative. Thanks. Well, uh, very good evening, ma'am. Priyanka Kaushik, the side. Uh, It was really a very wonderful session, ma'am. It is regarding, uh, we were discussing audio books here. So what my concern is, go with the audio books. What my kids prefer, they they just want, um, they would not go with the reading. They would only be interested in listening. They won't go on... Well, I'm, I didn't hear some of the end of that because there was some feedback or something going on, but my guess is you're trying to figure out how to get them book and I'll do is listen to the shall book, I, right? Shall I come up with my um, question again? Sure, go ahead. If- yeah, it is It is that uh, whenever I go with the audio books for my students, they, they are more interested into uh, the section of audio section only. They don't want to read the book of their own. They don't want to go into the text. So how shall I help them to uh, be a good reader apart from being a listener for the audio book? Well, you know, one thing you can do with that is you can actually hand them the, the print copy of the audio book and have them follow along with the text. So then they can actually see the words because that are being that are being spoken, and you. That is actually how um, early readers start having that um, pre those pre literacy skills. When a parent at home, you know, even with your two year old or three year old, when you read a story aloud to them and they're looking at the book with you while you're reading, they are they are following along. That's how they start to learn to read, just by listening to you and following along in the book. Now, at first, of course, that two-year-old isn't actually understanding that they're, what those little squiggles are on the page, that those are words. But eventually, they start figuring it out. And anybody who has ever done with, with their child knows that at some point, your child will, you'll be reading and you'll skip a word or you'll say the wrong word because that's what we do when we read our brains actually make substitutions right and they'll say no 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 you didn't read that right and you go what do you mean and they'll go and they'll actually point to it on the page no no you forgot this word right here and that means to me that I haven't taught them to read they've learned just from listening to me and watching the book so I don't see why that would be any different now give them a print copy and have them follow along uh, ma'am, most of the time they they do have a printed uh, script for the audio book they mm-hmm. go with, but they are uh, though they follow the reading with the audio book. But yes, if I ask them that now you you shall uh, read the chapter along, they they won't go. 
they would uh, they would seek the audio book only for the next time as well they won't uh, they won't be interested in you know their self reading are, now are these audio books are they long books or are they picture books like short books no they are picture books they are mm. complete picture books and uh, the audio books are also very 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 uh, you know narrative uh, kind so so it is very interesting for them to listen to but yes whenever they are asked to read of their own they won't go with it Have you tried Reader's Theater with them? Uh, not, not yet. You know what Reader's Theater is? Reader's Theater is when you give a child a, you give the kids the script. It's like it's like doing a play, but they don't have to memorize the lines. So you give, you have a story, and you 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 can you can get these. There are books of them on, and they're available online, um, or you can make your own from from a picture book. But you have. The story there, and you assign parts, and then you have the kids read, and they have to read their part. So they're actually performing, but they have to read to do it. And it's kind of it makes it more, more dynamic for them, and it, and it's fun. Yeah, because you're not yeah. just reading to yourself in your head now. Now you're reading, you're reading. Like I said, you're making a performance, and yes. if there are kids who have that are, I have found that. There is not one child, even the shyest child in my class, will clamor for a part after they see it happen once or twice because they realize that they're not they're not in it on their own because there'll be you know ten parts or five or six parts and so they're part of a group reading so they're not all by themselves having to do it and they're not having to stand up and act they can do it from their seat if they want or you can have them like sometimes we I have the kids stand up in front of the classroom depends upon what we're doing. But they but they read the part, and so now they're reading. Yes, we we smartly did it for them, it. and we we simultaneously we we created a performance for them. It will exactly. be a yeah, it will be a new thing. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, very informative, ma'am. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Very good evening, ma'am. Hello. Can you hear me? Very good evening, ma'am. Hello. Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I am Sharda, the librarian. Okay. Yeah, first, around third standard, no. I ask my children to go for Indianized books, Indian authors, because I feel that they can connect them easily, like authors like Sudha Murthy, Anushka Ravi Shankar. Mm-hmm. After I am hearing you, I think is it the better way of doing inculcating on them the interest on reading? Is it good? Well, my belief is that. you you give kids a variety of things and you have, and obviously you have to give them what's available to you um you know when i when i came to the library that i'm in now um there were no books that talked about there were no stories from the, from the world like it was just everything was westernized so i have worked very hard to bring in to make my my library much more diverse and multicultural and um and expose my students to stories from around the world and to characters from around the world they can even be stories you know they they might be they might be american authors but they're but they're writing about other parts of the world they're writing about characters who have who experienced things in other parts of the world um and i think that but those weren't available to them before so how would they ever know uh so i think you have to you have to use what you have available to you and if all you have available to you are are stories from indian authors then that's fine um if you can if you have access to to materials from other parts of the world well then you can use those too there's no right way or wrong way it's just the idea is to get kids to read and um I mean if you it depends upon what your objective is if your objective is simply to get them to read then you know those are fine if you want them to learn about what life looks like in other places well then you would probably want to read something that maybe came from another place and i'm still working on that that's hard for me to to even do because i i i can tell you that things that i have published that i have in my library they might be stories from other parts of the world for example i i don't know if you noticed in one of the pictures i showed that um they were reading a story called patan's pumpkin which is apparently indian it's an indian folklore 
but it wasn't, it was published in, in a Western publishing house, right? Um, so it's not perhaps written in the same way it would have been written if it uh, published and if it had been published say in India. So like I said, that does it, if you, it depends on what your objective is, whether or not you want to press to expose kids to more diversity or not. Thank you. If you think it will get them to read more, then by all means, do it. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Good evening, ma'am. Hello, how are you? Uh, I'm Aina, ma'am. I'm very fine. Ma'am, actually, whenever I try to promote my students for reading, of what the parents do from their side, they encourage the child to reading, but to read the academic books only. At that time, what happened? The child gets irritated uh, to read the same book which he has already, the teacher has taught. So how to encourage the parents that any book reading which will, uh, which will help the child uh, to enhance the pronunciation as well as a reading habit? How to en encourage the parents? Okay, so how to encourage parents to have their children read something that was not already read in school. That's what you're asking? Uh, yeah, ma'am. Because the children, they always love to read the comic book, the story books, but the parents, they force them to read the mathematics, EVS, and every time the child is not interested to read the same book. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I think that, that part of your job well, part of our jobs, I shouldn't say your job, part of our jobs as educators is we don't just educate um, the students, we have to educate the parents as well. And you have to make it known to your parents that it's okay for them to read things that aren't just textbooks or mathematics books, that, that reading in any form is okay. And perhaps you need to create a way to... Um, to give those resources where they can get those things to the parents so that you basically so that you're saying that you're giving permission, right? It's kind of like, it's kind of like the, the Bitmoji library that I created. That's not just for me and my students, that's for the parents too. And it's a way I communicate with them and show them these are the things that we're doing that, that, that we're advocating in school that are, doesn't have to be that particular. It doesn't have to be a Bitmoji library. It could be a website. It could be a newsletter that you send home. It could be, um, I don't know if you do parent teacher conferences, any kind, anytime you have a contact with a parent, just you know, talk about other reading resources and not just those textbooks. And it may not happen overnight because I think that Parents come to the education process with a certain mindset. And, you know, part of, part of what we need to do is, is help them change that mindset. Because ultimately what we're all trying to do is help the child. And if we can, if we can understand that we're on the same team, then if you have that trust, then parents may, um, may be more open to trying, letting their students try other things at home. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Really, your session was so wonderful. There are many tech ways, and really, we will apply it. Thank you so ma much. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Excuse ma me, ma'am. Here, uh, I have a question as a teacher, ma'am. Can I proceed? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, actually, uh, as a teacher, I'm asking this question. Uh, reading story and encouraging uh, students to read story, uh, uh, we always prefer age-appropriate books for them. So story reading and comprehending, it will not be a difficult uh, uh, what, uh, activity for them. But how to go about with poems, ma'am, especially for pre-primary and primary students? Is that uh, how to enhance uh, their language skills through poems? Is it necessary to explain each word in the poem or uh, how to go about this one? Oh, poetry. Yeah, ma'am. Poetry, that's, that's always a difficult one because poetry is not, it's not so straightforward, right? It's a lot of metaphor, metaphorical language, a lot of imagery. Um, I don't think you need to explain every single I'm word living the class at least to start and i will say that 
there's a lesson I do with my first graders. And all we do in that, in that, in that lesson is I ask them to use their visualization skills. So I start by, we talk about what visualization is, you know, when you have an, an image in your mind as you're reading. And then I have them close their eyes and I read them a poem. And the poem does not have a title. I just read the poem and they're short poems. And I tell them before I start, I said, when, when I'm done reading the poem, I want you to tell me what season of the year that the poem takes place in and, and give me one reason why you think that. So they have to find evidence in, in the text or in the poem. So I read a very short poem. You know, um, one of them is about, it's, there, it doesn't actually say what this child is doing, but he's climbing up some stairs, he's bouncing and he's jumping and he's, and he's splashing into some water. So I have to, they, I say, well, what season do you think this is? And, you know, you know they, they say summer and I, well, why? Well, I think that he is, you know, going swimming. Well, why do you why do you think that? Well, he sounds like climbing up a di up this up to the diving board and he's jumping into the pool. Okay, so now they've had to give me a reason, but um, and I find even with first graders, they don't always know all the vocabulary, but they they get the feeling of what the poem is about and they have an understanding. And um, so I think to start with, you that's what you need to work on. With, with kids. Now, as they get older, they have to know, and the poems get more complex, they have to know more of the vocabulary. So what you might do, if you're going to be reading a complex poem, is you review vocabulary before you even read the poem. Go through and pull out the, the words that are going to be difficult for them and have an understanding of what those words me before you even begin and then I think you will find that you don't have to interrupt the flow of the poem and they will be able to to have an understanding you know but, but poetry is is difficult because you know the reason that poetry works is because words have multiple meanings and and um they they the words are used to create images they're not necessarily the words aren't always meaning what they would mean on their own. They're put together in a way to create a new meaning. So you have to be a little careful with being very, very concrete when it comes to to poetry. But I will say I don't actually, I can, I don't actually teach understanding of poetry. I just use it as a way to inspire kids to do more reading or to set a tone in the library. So. That's the best I can offer for you on that one. <laughs> yeah, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes. Hello. Hi, uh, ma'am. Namaste, ma'am. I am from Odisha. Huh. I am speaking from Odisha. Ma'am, I have provided e-books to the students, but they are not interested to read the book. Ma'am, can you suggest me how to encourage them to read or how read the books, e-books. Now, let me ask you a question back. Are e-books the only books they have access to right now? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that is a difficulty. And um, I am finding it, like, how to, how to describe this? When we first went into our, our lockdowns in, in, during this pandemic, our students were, they were thrilled with ebooks because they didn't have access to print books and they were so excited. So they were reading the ebooks, reading the ebooks, reading the ebooks. Now, but we didn't have a lot. I was so grateful at the time that so many publishers opened up um, their, their, their warehouses, you know, for us. And so we had so much, we had access to so many free resources, but of course, come this fall in the school year, a lot of those free resources are no longer offered. So I went ahead saying, oh, my kids, they love the eBooks. I bought a subscription to um, an eBook library to add to just to supplement my print library. And I'm finding right now that the students don't want to read the eBooks. And um, part of it, so I asked the kids, I actually said, you know, what's going on here? 
And part of it is that they are spending so much time um, online already that they don't want to spend more screen time. And, and it's funny because I do an entire multi-lesson unit about having balance between technology and everything else in your life. And, and I'm thinking to myself, as I'm listening to my kids that they're doing this, they, they understand that they're online all the time and that to read now online is not necessarily what they want to be doing. But that does not solve your problem. It just answers the question as to why they don't want to read, <laughs> perhaps. Um, and I haven't come across this yet. And, I, and, it's a, and it's actually a bridge I'm probably going to have to cross at some point, like what to do when they don't have access to print books. And they're so tired of the technology, so burnt out from being on the technology all the time that they don't want to read that way. And I guess... What I might suggest then is then moving to the to that third form, the audiobook, and having them just listen. Okay. Listen to the stories for now. Um, you know, and I know it's not the same as reading print. It does give them some skills. Um, or maybe make, you know what? Maybe make a contest. Have you have you tried that? Like trying to 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 kind of challenge them. You know, it could be, it could be an, 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 and actually I meant to talk about that in my presentation that some, sometimes getting, motivating kids to read, you have to do something extrinsic, like having a, an actual contest. And we're, we're, we're actually embarking in January on a readathon, an all school readathon. And um, with the hope that it will inspire kids even more to read. But if you give them a challenge, um, and if you if you read this much, you you earn you earn something, and it could be it could be something that's a, a small prize. It could be it could be you are exempt from a small piece of homework. It could be a a note home to your parents. It could be simply a certificate. Some kids are motivated by that, um, but make it into a contest. Make reading a contest for them. Who can read the most? you know, or who can, or set a goal for them. This is your goal for this week. How many students can meet this goal? If we have 80% of our students meet this goal, then we get to do this fun activity. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Hello. Sometimes um, that's what's needed. Good evening, is... Hello. Hello, good yes. Good evening. Uh, good evening, good evening ma'am. This is uh, John Peter from KSR Matriculation School, India, Tamil Nadu. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. It's just, it's just a it's breaking up a little bit. So it's I'm hearing um, like every third word. Is it okay? Okay. Yes. There are examples uh, of a different genre. Like uh, they don't know how to read a certain genre because of their abilities in learning skills. For example, a naughty child a playful child or different types of children are there. So could you suggest particularly like this type of uh, uh, children can read this type of, or the genre of book? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. So you're saying that you have students who, they don't want to read different genres. They don't want to read about students that who, are, who aren't like them. Yes. Is that, is that, is that your, what you're saying? Yes, please suggest them a genre which would be comfortable for them. For example, a student who's good at sports, he may not like something to read very uh, pathos or uh, something related to that. So he might like sports books. So is it something you have a protocol which you can suggest? Well, um, my thought that for pleasure reading that you should just read what it is you like. And if all you like to read are sports books, then by me, all means just read sports books. Um, there are sports books that deal with other issues. For example, right now I am reading a series to my fifth graders. I'm reading a book called Ghost. And oh. it is actually, it is actually has nothing to do with spooky. It has nothing to do with the supernatural. It is a sports book. It is a book about a young man who yes. is lives 
a very unfortunate life. Um, it is very different from the lives of my students. And in fact, I actually had a parent come to me and say, how could you be reading this book with, my, with our students? And I explained to her that we're reading it because it's a way to build empathy, right? When you read about people who are not like you and who are experience things that you don't experience. Um, but ultimately the book is, it's also about a boy who's learning to run track. So for someone like me, I have no interest in sports books, but I love this book because it is, it has so many more deeper layers to it. The, the track is just the carrot, right? And I'm finding that my students are, every student begs me to read. I, I go, my, the way I set up my, my, my classes each week is I try to, <clears throat> I try to read for 10 to 15 minutes before, and then we have a mini lesson, right? But it's been a little difficult because I have 30 minutes with them. So what I'm trying to do is on our days when we are all remote, that's when I read and I read the whole period. I read for 30 minutes to the fifth graders because they can sustain for that long. But I come in on the other days when we have a shorter class and we're in person and they're like, what do you mean you're not gonna read? You have to read, we have to know what's gonna happen. They're so excited. Even the kids who I have to beg to check a book out of the library are so excited to read this book. And the conversations that we have are not about running track. They're about the relationships that these kids have with each other. They're about why this student, why this child in the story, why this protagonist makes the choices that he makes because he does not make good choices. And we talk about that and we talk about, we talk about that in relationship to our own lives. So even though our life is not this child's life, we relate it back to our own lives and they're, they're definitely getting so much more out of that book. And it's just a sports, some people would view it as just a sports book, or you could use it with a student like yours, like you're suggesting who only has an interest in a certain thing. So I think our job as educators and librarians is to connect those students who only, who only seem to have an interest in one area and direct them to books that might encompass more than one area. Um, I have students who would, I have students who would only read um, history, which is, you would think, oh, not, that's not bad. They're only read, but they would only read nonfiction. So I introduced them to historical fiction and I found, you know, I started with something small so that they wouldn't have to invest a lot of time in it. And slowly and slowly, they were, they took on harder texts and more complex texts. I have a little third grader right now. He's so stubborn. For kindergarten, first and second grade, all he would read were books about postal workers postal and policemen. That's it. His dad's a policeman. All he wants to read about are policemen. And, um, you know, I don't have that many books about policemen in the library. He's read them a thousand times. So this year, when I saw him, I said, you know what, this isn't, I said, this is, he, he asked me, he's like, do you have anything new? I said, you know, I said, I, unfortunately, I don't. I said, so one of us has to change. I said, either you have to come up with something different that you like to read, or, you know, I have to go find some more money to go buy more books. I said, and I don't have more money. And he kind of laughed and he said, oh, fine. And so I said, well, can I, can, I, can I get you something a little different? And he said, fine. So I brought him a book about um, rescue dogs. Oh. So it has not, you know, police are the only, they're ancillary because they're rescue dogs in all phases. Oh. There are police rescue dogs, there are fire rescue dogs, there are Coast Guard rescue dogs, but they're rescue dogs. And he was like, oh, this is kind of cool. And so that, and he okay with that book and you know what that did for him the next week when I came he said he asked me for a different a book about something else this week he asked me he's like do we have any books in the library about knights and castles oh. and I said I think I do so I brought him a big stack of books about knights and castles it just took working with him to kind of get him off that one topic into others and I think that's where we have to put the time in and, and some research to figure out what's available for them because they don't know and they and they like 
comfortable. It always comes back to that, that comfort, right? Fine. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, ma'am. Uh, advanced Christmas wishes and uh, Happy New Year, too. Thank you. Can I, nice can I also you. add one more thing? Um, <laughs> you know, one, one more thing I think uh, that also helps is pairing the kid with other group of kids, you know, who, let's say, for example, if you know there is, there is a group of kids in your class who, who read a particular type of, you know, uh, genre, right? Uh, and you want this particular kid and you see there is a potential, doesn't matter whether he is a naughty and a good boy, you know, whatever that may be, irrespective of what the kid is, you know, Fine. you you may take that kid into that cluster, you know, basically opening them to that a new horizon altogether and having them kind of encouraging them to discuss about some, you know, two or three uh, very uh, exciting things that they are learning from that process. So sometimes hearing from peers, and it's a normal thing, right? If I hear my, you know, peer colleague doing something and uh, he is basically uh, earning a lot of kind of rewards or praises or whatever it may be, I also get excited about it and I read about that topic, right? And I also want to talk about it, right? Eventually. Yes. So if, if, if we pair them with those group of kids who have been there, done that, have experienced it, right? Uh, and also basically have some sort of a, a kind of, you know, watching mechanism that let me continue to review how he is progressing in that direction, right? And we, we also can, the other thing that we also can do is um, like, uh, for example, a kid may be having, uh, you know, reviewing his, you know, let's say by month to month basis that what is he that, he is really good at and what is it that he needs to get good at, right? And then, you know, finding those uh, topics of interest that oh. will basically, and then you will see that in a month or two's time, uh, the kid has automatically kind of, you know, something has clicked and he's becoming good at that particular thing where he was lagging behind two months ago. So that automatically generates a lot of interest and, you know, uh, something to kind of look forward to. And hopefully that will help the kid to have more open mind rather than kind of, you know, uh, thinking just about the topic he likes to read or, you know, explore about. Right. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And to, to piggyback on that idea, uh, what we do in a lot of schools here, in a lot of classrooms, teachers will not just necessarily read one book with their whole class, they will break their class up into small groups and assign, and well, they don't always assign. Sometimes they have them choose. They say, okay, you guys, your group, pick a book to read. And so now if you engineer those groups a little bit, you will, you will suddenly be exposing um, students to things that they probably wouldn't have been exposed to before. And they'll be talking about it with kids that they wouldn't have spoken to before as well. So you're not just encouraging them to work with somebody, you're actually giving them an assignment. Okay, you're going to explore this book together and it's going to be, this book is going to be your book and it's going to be different from this group's book and from this group's book. And so you can really kind of target and kind of, like I would say, that's, that's, that's where the teacher is kind of the great and wonderful Oz, you know, you, you're, you're controlling it from behind the scenes and they don't even know. One, Thank other, you. One, other, one other idea in that process, oh. Peter, is also rotation, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, just to be fair on everybody in that group setting, right? Uh, like I may like politics, uh, the other kid may like sports, the other kid may like some, um, you know, some personality, bio, bi uh, you know, biography or whatever. So, uh, we can have a rotation that, okay, this week we will, you know, you like fiction, let's go and pick a fiction book and do something with it. Next week we will switch to, you know, something else and we'll go and work on that. So that way, like everybody kind of, you know, experiences that and starts to, you know, learn that, hey, you know what, 
there is more in this world around us than just you know thinking about one particular thing yes true nice good evening madam good evening madam hello hello good evening good evening uh, madam i am from odisha uh, i am asking uh, one question that your session is very wonderful uh, i am asking uh, students are afraid of uh, science and uh, mathematics uh, particularly so can we uh, encourage the students to read popular science books or mathematics books can we encourage them or in which way you can encourage them you mean what 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 is out there to encourage students who are interested in science and mathematics is that what you're asking yes well are you look, are you looking to encourage them to read fiction are you encouraging them to read other things or are you trying to find more non science and mathematics books i'm sorry non fiction type of so you want them to read more non fiction yes yes okay well um here in the united states we have a we have a lot of access to to nonfiction. So, for example, in my library, I have, I have, even though I'm only elementary, I'm preschool to grade five. Um, I have a whole section devoted to math. You know, that's and, and there are math puzzles in there. There are books that, in picture book form or in a, or, or in a fun form, explain math concepts. Um, there is a series called. Um, the Wayside School um, by Louis Sichar, and um, they're, they're, it's all about math. Um, I read a series, you remember that author I talked about earlier, that New Jersey author, Dan Gutman? He, has, he wrote a series of books called um, um, The Genius Files, and they're all that all of those books are filled with codes and ciphers. And so when I read those books to the kids, we learn about codes and ciphers and I have them create codes and ciphers, which are mathematical concepts. Um, so there are books out there, both fiction and nonfiction that kids can read. Now, if you're looking for something specific, I mean, other than those, like, it would depend upon exactly what aspect of those of those concepts you're looking for. I mean, I have in my science, I have science section of my library. I have books exploring magnetism, um, light, you know, uh, measurement. I have books about how to conduct an experiment. I have a book called How to Create the World, and it talks about what you would need to do if you wanted to create your own planet. You know, and it talks about all the con the scientific concepts that go into that, but at a very in a very simplistic form because it's elementary. Um, I have books on conducting experiments so they can you know, take check out the book and go home and collect all the things they need and, and create an experiment. But in fact, when we have our science fair each year, the students come to the library and take the books and go and, and find an experiment um, to, to, to try. I have books on computer programming. Um, this, this this past week was computer science and education week and it was the hour of code worldwide right so i spent the whole week teaching my students computer programming and on my cart of books that they could check out were all of the books i have about how to program so we had programming in scratch python everything the books are there but they're for kids i had one call that's called um how to program star wars and it tells them, it shows them what to do. They can go on online with an app and create programs. So that also is mathematics. So I think there are books out there. It's just whether or not you have access to them. Hello. Okay. Thank um, you, madam. Did that, did that help you? I'm not sure if that helped you. <laughs> Thank you, madam, for your nice explanation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayerson, and yes. uh, 
thank you uh, all the participants i guess we are run uh, i guess we have a whole host of very enthusiastic participants here, over here uh, uh, ms mayasin we will request uh, you know probably if we could put together uh, the uh, questions and send them send it to you uh, hope we hear from you hear the answers from you and we will send it back to the participants because i guess there we are running out of time now uh, yeah you really opened up this forum uh, I, i guess your talk was beyond uh, just beyond the the regular line of uh, course and uh, you know it's it's helped us explore a lot of uh, you know a lot of these territories and uh, I, i mean that's why i guess it's gotten into the minds and of people and they help help them create new questions absolutely so um what we'll do is we'll put together this and send it to you uh, requesting the participants to send across your questions uh, and thank you so much uh, ms uh, mayasin and uh, uh, if there is anything that you would want to add in at the end of the session uh, you know, may i request you to do that um i'm just I just wanted to let everyone know that i will provide you with a copy of the presentation so that the people so that everybody can have it with all the links if they if they want to use them and i will also add an addendum to some resources that that i found helpful about um the importance of reading during a pandemic because there has been a lot actually written about it so far so i can include those resources as well so people have that and of course if there are questions i will add if I add what i can to answer those questions because we sure, are and I see we are we are well over the time that <laughs> that was allotted yes yes but but if <laughs> getting, you see we also be have late there no but if you see there has been a lot of uh, you know appreciation there on the chat box and yes, uh, i've been, know, I've been are, noticing that yes uh, so i guess it explains uh, you know the the kind of uh, you know uh, response we you have for your session and the kind of interest people have taken so i guess that makes up for all the time and i'm sure they want more time i guess we will have to wrap it up well i i'm just thinking that people there you have you have work you have work tomorrow morning and school tomorrow morning so and if you're a teacher you get up early i'm sure so thank you so much ma'am uh, 